Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Awesome Cast. Yes, I'm here again. That means we're doing another awesome interview. Today, I'm very excited to bring Caitlin Robrock onto the podcast. Caitlin, thank you so much for your time. You are welcome. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So just to, to get us started off, I, you know, the usual kickoff question is, you know, what, what have you been working on that you can tell us about? I know NDAs are a thing, so... That usually ruins a lot of the fun. It, that can. Let's see. To be safe, I, I won't give too many specifics. I'm sure. Sorry. But there was a show that was just announced recently that will come out later this year. And I'm excited to be a part of it. They haven't given any specifics yet. So just to be safe. But it, it's a show I very much enjoy doing. And I'm, th I'm throughout the whole run of the first season. Um, but once... Once we're kind of allowed to talk about it, I can tell what, what studio is producing it. I know that's kind of nothing. But um, the, the, the recent announcement did say it was going to come out next year. Okay. So I'm looking forward to that. And then this year, oh, we did just announce for Disney's 100th anniversary, uh, Steamboat Silly is on its way as part of uh, Paul Rudish's Mickey Mouse Shorts universe. And then there's a very special 100th anniversary short coming from Disney Feature Animation. So both of those are extremely special. And I, I really loved both of them. And they've both been in the works for a couple of years now. So I'm very excited that they can finally come out and, and show you what we made. That has to be just an incredible experience getting to participate in Disney's 100th anniversary in such a special way. I mean, when when you're talking about just like, characters that are that are known throughout uh pop culture and, and around the world it's hard to get much higher than Minnie Mouse yeah like she I think if I'm thinking like semantics or or number wise like she's the longest running female animated character um and there's no signs of stopping like so many shows will come and go or they might have reboots but you know they're kind of finite and Mickey and Minnie and the gang they all feel infinite yeah, very, very grateful and and happy to be along for that ride for as long as I can. Yeah, absolutely. That that's that's just incredible, and I'm I'm happy for you that you get to experience that because that that just has to be unbelievable. It is. It, it has some trials. We had a very interesting record session today that involved um, whispering, and whispering. You know, we, no one really talks in whispers for long periods of time. So I learned today <laughs> what are my limits when it comes to whispering. Yeah, voice. It's much harder than I thought because I never had to do it before. Right. Yeah. That was yeah, a little it, challenge. Well, you know, that's that's just yeah. That's that's one of the things that fascinates me about about actors is all the different kind of things they get to experience that you know you you wouldn't typically think about. Like like you said, and nobody whispers all the time for you know like two, three, however long the session goes. Right. You know. Yeah, and that varies depending how many projects we have. I, I often will go in for a standard episode of a TV show. And then once you're kind of paid for that episode, it also includes any pickups or dialogue changes or ADR or looping. So it encompasses all of that. But if you had to go into the studio one day and it was just for pickups and things, which was already paid for, you would be paid a session fee for having to go in in the first place. So it's like kind of two different options. Yeah. Usually they'll have me do a brand new episode for that payment and then they'll slide in the ADR and the looping or the singing after it. So like you can get a three for the price of one. Yeah. Well, let's let's pull out a little bit and uh, I, I want to explore just getting to know you a little bit. That's, that's really what I like to do here. Let me ask. What it is that made you first take an interest in acting? I, I'm, I've told this story before, but it still bears repeating because it means a lot to me. But I remember um, when I was a kid, we it was the year Beauty and the Beast came out. And of course, we're like, let's go see the next movie. But my brother was not exactly like a princess fan. But he he always watched animated movies with us. But he he worked his butt off convincing me to not go see Beauty and the Beast for my birthday because I got to choose the movie. 
when we were up at my uncle's place kind of house sitting while they were out of town. And he convinced me to go see Hook instead, which came out the same year. And watching that movie was so pivotal because uh, Robin Williams really made me laugh. And it was the first time I like saw him and and recognized, oh, this is a person that I'm really drawn to. I'm very specified on. So I knew like, oh, he made me laugh a lot. It's in a big movie. He looked like he was having a lot of fun. I think that's kind of what I want to do for a job. Because up until that point, I think I'd considered veterinarianism since I'd loved animals. But never really thought much beyond that. Because you don't really think about that stuff when you're eight. And then the following year, he came out again with Aladdin doing the genie. And once I realized it's the same person, but he's now a part of a cartoon, that was when it switched like, oh, I want to do cartoons as well. And I want to do funny and I want to do screaming and I want to I want to be wild and wacky just like this guy. That's when the seed was planted. And then it took, you know, it took 20 plus years, but it came to fruition. Yeah, I think there there's really something very human about making that connection between like a character either you know an animated production or a live action production seeing that character and then at some point realizing oh there's a there's a real human being behind that mm -hmm. um yeah there, there's always some kind of pull of oh i want to th there's something there's something like right there in the middle that i want to explore yeah and it, it really comes out of like for me and people like me, if when we connect emotionally with a performance or a voice or a sound uh, or a visual, the types of emotions it evokes are can be so powerful to the point of like, I almost want to shut down so I'm not feeling so much because I feel very, very deeply and it, it can be a hindrance sometimes if I can't get my mind off of it. Yeah. Um, and to that end, like, well, in a way I could pay it forward by I hope my work or my performance is making people laugh or make, making people feel sympathy or, or even anger. Because uh, I got a lot of um, fans for a Gretzko who said like, oh, I don't like Gretzko's mom. She reminds me of my mom. And like, oh, then I'm doing my job. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that, that performance out there of like, yeah, this is, this is the kind of mom I wouldn't want to have. And my mother was never like <laughs> Gretzko's mom. But it's so easy to make her so cringe yeah people people can have very strong uh feelings about stuff like that when it when it touches something that's just so personal mm -hmm. and that that doesn't mean it's a bad thing either it can mean like it's an important thing there's a handful of movies that i think are phenomenal movies they're very good everyone should watch them to see if they feel how i feel but because i feel so strongly i can't watch them anymore because it's like do I have that time and presence to allow myself to be in that emotional state? It Not really. Like, I'm a very busy person <laughs> just because it can kind of take you out. Like, the, feeling those emotions or having those thoughts can knock you out. Yeah. Where you're just like, I need to go to bed for a little bit. I'm feeling too many things. So I'll defend to the death every single Don Bluth movie. They're all just phenomenal. But, like, it's very difficult to watch The Land Before Time. Or Guillermo del Toro, like Pan's Labyrinth and The Orphanage. They're very hard to watch because I get so sad with the subject matter. And I really want to believe that, like, this is the true ending, right? They're happy, right? I don't want to consider the alternate. And that just proves what an amazing director he is and a storyteller and a writer. Like, it's so important to have those movies. And I'll definitely give them a watch at least one time. But then after that, I got to see, is this something I can handle more than once? Or can I take that emotion and run with it for something else in the future for myself? Yeah. Um, it's so funny you mentioned Pan's Labyrinth because I have such a strong memory of the end of that movie. And mm -hmm. my friend and I were watching it and he's like, oh, well, you know, this is what happened. I'm like, no, that is not what happened. <laughs> I, I am of the mind of it is real. She transcended you know, at the moment of her passing and that like, oh, no, she's in the real realm. She is where she's supposed to be. Everyone's there. This is actually happening. This is not in her mind. This is not synapses firing. Like, I can't even talk about it because it gets me so emotional because I just yeah. refuse to believe in non-happy endings. Yeah. We get enough real life and we get enough sadness every day. So when I see movies or TV shows or books, like I want happy endings. Like, I don't need to see like, oh, well, you know, realistically, everyone would die. I'm like, no, no, not here. 
Not in this movie theater. <laughs> yeah, it, it it certainly does offer you a choice in terms of how you interpret the end of that uh, the end of that movie. But also, like you know, oh, you can interpret it so many ways. I'm someone who's like, no, I need one way. <laughs> it is real in Inception. That little thing wobbled. It doesn't wobble if it's inside your head. That's really happening. The clothes are different on the kids. You know, here we go. I'm getting my Jim- my Jimmies are rustled. Here we go. But I need like definite endings. <laughs> oh man, I-, I feel like we could probably just go down that rabbit hole for a while. But I'll I'll keep it moving. Um, yeah, we'll do a part two. Yes, exactly. Um, I'll let Caitlin's umbrage the things that make her mad. Yes. We'll, we'll we'll just get really into it next time. Who would you say has had the biggest impact on your career? And that can be, you know, I know you mentioned Robin Williams and his performance, but it could also be just someone who's encouraged you or, or gave you advice or anything like that. I can really track a lot of my progression. And I, I have like key moments in my life where I can track certain events and certain people to being a direct result to my success or the person I am now. The biggest influence on my acting style and how I perceive comedy and delivering wit or humor in voiceover are, are, are the two best voice actors I think that are existing today. And it's Tress McNeil and Maurice LaMarche. I think they are like the absolute best voice actors there are today. And they were both so integral to how I grew up and how I defined humor and and how to deliver and th- they were very crucial and of course Rusi taylor being like an inspiration and being someone to aspire like and um bob bergen was one of my very first teachers so he he's also very instrumental in giving me the building blocks on how to act how to conduct myself and he 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 knew my dream from very early on, and it was to to be the voice of Minnie Mouse and to do ADR and looping for animated features. And both of those are very niche and require a lot of time and effort and practice. And I have now successfully done both. I'm doing both of those right now, so I'm I'm in my sweet spot. And then, like as far as direct correlations to my career, uh, Jess Harnell he helped me get my very first voiceover job. It's a wild story which led to keeping in contact with the creators of this show who brought me onto another show for a callback. And even though I didn't get that show, someone there took me to another show, uh, Mr. Pickles on Adult Swim, and that was my first show. And then I had a show. I made my demo with Bill Farmer, who I met through a mutual friend, and like, oh, Bill made my first demo, and he got me in the door at my agency. So there's, there's a lot of people who have very direct hands in my career. So I always want to make sure I'm remembering like what they gave me and like it, it's crucial that they know how important they are to me. So I tell them quite frequently, probably annoyingly. So <laughs> how how much they mean to me. That's fantastic, though, that you were able to kind of ride this wave, you know, going from from one person to another. And it's incredible that they found you. They helped you. You know, they, they helped you get to where you've always wanted to be. And, you know, just as it, it's impossible to not be moved by that as a human being, because it's something that we all dream about and, and wish for and strive for. Mm-hmm. And to see it happen for someone, you know, it's it's just really incredible. And, you know, I'm glad that you keep those with you because, you know, that that says a lot about who you are. Oh, good. Tenacious, I hope. But I definitely, um, I never wanted to have a big head about it because I knew I wanted to do it and I'd practiced for eons. And I'm sure for a lot of ladies out there that auditioned, you know, they only, the audition process was only about like a 10 day window before it would be submitted and then continue on to callbacks or what have you. So for a lot of women, like they had 10 days or, or, or not even that, I think it was a week, like a Tuesday to Tuesday. So you had a week to discover, is this something you could do? And sometimes for a character, it's like, oh, I just didn't know I could. And they're really good at it. And it's a luck of the draw. But a lot of times you want to have as much preparation as you can for a voice like that. And there's plenty of people who do amazing Bugs Bunnies or Daffy Ducks or Goofies. And just like it's something they've been practicing or things they love to do. And you never know when an opportunity might arise. So 
practice it and keep it in that forefront. I don't believe in like really sharing it or talking too much about it because I don't, I didn't want to be perceived as like gunning for the role or thinking I was better than I really was. I, I, I try, I want to err on the side of humbleness and never assume that I'm at my best because then I'll stop trying. Then I'll stop working hard. So anytime I don't book things or if I'm feeling like, are my auditions being submitted? Am I being considered at all for roles? Or am I being dismissed because it's something about my performance, what something I'm doing or not doing versus like, oh, they wanted this person from the get go. This was really a direct offer. The auditions were backups or it was going to go to a celebrity anyway. Those are nice thoughts to help us go to bed at night. But I always try to make it make it be on my shoulders. That way I'm always working and always trying to better myself. That way I can bring to the table when I am hired. I don't want it to be a fluke. That's. That's terrific. Um, I always like to hear about what keeps an actor motivated because it is, you, you mentioned, you know, being tenacious, tenacious, and it absolutely requires a lot of tenacity because it's, you know, if you're looking at it purely in, in like mathematical terms, it's a career where you fail more often than you succeed if we're just using that as a binary right not not like you know taking into account growth and you know experiences not and all those things that are important uh because sometimes sometimes it's hard for us when we perceive failure to look past that and to be like well you know i'm i'm still growing i'm still trying some you know Sometimes the failures are harder than others, and it's yeah. it's really important that you are able to to have that tenacity and you know keep yourself motivated because that's that's kind of the thing and and it's true in life a lot you know a lot of times too sometimes you just have to find a way to get to tomorrow like you know they always say like oh, you only book one percent of your auditions and like not even that uh, people who book frequently. A lot of times they're actors who have been in the game for a long time and they've got a good reputation and they're well known and they're a safe choice of like, oh, we can have this delivered. Or sometimes they're new people who might be popular in one area, so they have them to do voiceover, but it may not succeed. We won't know until we see the final product. But because there's such a huge flush now of new voice actors, now that a lot of things are remote and a lot of possibilities can happen at home all across the country. But so many of these actors, they're not quite ready yet in terms of their growth and their polish and, and being able to deliver an A-plus performance straight through the audition instead of having to be worked on it in the final product. So that's kind of an ongoing fight we have when we're booking. And everyone starts from the ground up somewhere. I would just hope that they're being given the right direction on how to better themselves so they don't think, oh, I'm amazing. But like, you're you're not there yet, kiddo. Got to keep working and they need those failures to grow from you know you need to fail often in order to recognize what made me fail this time how can i achieve that for next time and if there comes that day where it's like well i'm i'm really great at what i'm doing right now i'm very happy i'm not stagnant but i'm not plateaued then um you can enjoy the journey and that's i feel like that's a good key of like you're in the right career if you're enjoying the journey as much as the end result, you're not working. You're you're having fun and you're aiming towards a goal, but you're not wasting your time. You're not feeling let down. Because I've, I've worked jobs in the past where like I'm working for the sole purpose of being able to put a roof over my head and food in my mouth. And what's the highlight of my day? 5 p.m. when it's time to go home. And that's nobody wants to kind of exist like that. Or if you do, like you want to work it where like this is set, a set aside of time. I'm doing this job. Sometimes a job is just a job, but you have your dreams and aspirations outside of that. And you work towards those moments and and spouses or kids or friend trips around the world or or finding those things that mean something to you. And I've always been an internal person where I need to feel good in here before I can be good out there, especially among others. So with voiceover, even though pr pretty much probably every audition in my mailbox right now, I won't book, but I want to enjoy the moment I did have it, which is this audition. 
you know, in this, in these two minutes right now, I'm living this character and I'm performing this character the way I would want to see that character on TV. What's going to make me laugh? What's going to make me agree with them and feel something? And once I've done that, like, this is a really good thing. I feel great about myself for having achieved that part of myself. All right, let's send it off and see what happens. And I'll book things that I'll think like, that? I didn't think that was, I was just kind of goofing around, but that seems to be a thing they want to do. Or there have been times when like, this is difficult, but I really want to read for it. I'm just not quite getting it. So let's just kind of shuck it off and do like, what's, what are you thinking of right now? And then they'll book that because it was the most organic. It really was the most honest take. I don't know how I felt in that moment. And we're going to have to make sure I can find that feeling again in the actual session. But being honest with your auditions is the most important thing you can do. Because that way when they book you, like, they'll know, oh, this is exactly who you're getting. This is exactly what you wanted for the read. If you want to try experimenting, you can do that in the session or or play around and see, or at home, if you're auditioning, do a second take. I do a second take frequently. You know, the one I do my first take, what do I want to do? What's going to make me laugh? What, what does this archetype mean for me? You know, and even if it's an archetype, I'm not very versed in, my agent will send me along as a wild card. Like, Hey, this isn't your typical military leader, but this is how Caitlin would do it. And it's evocative and it's believable. If I get it, great. If not, I can always work towards the the real type of archetype on my own time. Just want to shift gears a little bit. What are some of the interests that you have outside of acting? <laughs> uh, acting, since acting is such a mental gymnastic for all actors, where it, it's not a side job, it's not a part time job, it's a full hustle. Right. Anyone who says, "Oh, I just do this for part time," and like, then you must be a really good savant, where booking things are just easy for you and you're blessed to have that voice or they've just started and give it a few years let's come back and see where they're at but um so much of my time and money and dedication to the craft has kind of dominated my life for almost two decades I would say that I didn't really develop a lot of habits outside of it I love reading so I have like my iPad's got like library apps so I read books all the time I definitely love watching tv shows it's harder now because it's hard to get involved in new shows because for all we know they're just going to be canceled after a season so why bother yeah and i hear like oh this show's amazing this show's great and like yeah but if it's going to get canceled i don't want to invest my time and feelings just to be let down and end on a cliffhanger that's happened way too many times so i usually wait until a show has completed and then i'll say like oh did it complete on the creator's terms you know, did they know, hey, this is our last season, let's tie everything up, and then I can binge it as a whole? Or are they like, no, it ended on this great thing, like, I'm sorry, can't do it. But I, I have two roommates that I love living with, because I just like living with people. And so we hang out a lot, we go to movies, or go to theme parks, or eat out at restaurants. And I like reading comics. I like latch hooking. I like cooking. I like baking. I really want a cat. I don't have a cat but I really want one. And I like to visit my parents once a month. That way I get more time with them. That's pretty much in a nutshell. <laughs> Good answers. Well, before I let you go, if people want to follow along with what you're doing and, and maybe try and uh, sleuth whatever show you're teasing at the, at the start of the interview, uh, where can people follow you at? I am on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram is krobrock, K-R-O-B-R-O-C-K. My little avatar is Miss Piggy because she's the best. And then Twitter is at Caitlin Robrock. My full name, no periods. And both of those are like up to date with new things I'm doing or things that have just dropped. Or if I can, I'll try to get like a sample of my work or just my opinions. If anyone cares to hear what I think about sandwiches or sleep paralysis demons or, or you know, shoot the breeze. And my DMs are always open. So talk to me, please. Well, Caitlin, thank you so much for your time and for opening up to us and letting us get to know you a little bit. It's been an absolute pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to yet another production of The Awesome Cast, your podcast for everything awesome. You can find us online at awesomecast.com, O-S-M-C-A-S-T.com, or, you know, wherever you find your podcast, just search for Awesome Cast. You can also find us on the social medias, 
AwesomeCast at Twitter or on Facebook. Of course, you can also find our wonderful interview guru, the greatest living interviewer, John Robbins at J5 is Live. Or perhaps you'd like to follow our amazing editor, Anna, at Angel Dark Fire. Or just me, at It's Basil Time on Twitter. Our theme song is produced by DJ Inabito, and you can find him online at djinabito.com. And once again, thanks for listening to the Awesome Cast. We appreciate you. <laughs>